Good morning. A few decades ago, a Nobel laureate described India as a wounded civilization. He was an Indian born in Trinidad. I, on the other hand, am an Indian born in Pakistan, and I describe India not as a wounded civilization, but as an amputated civilization. Amputated because forgotten by most of you who were born, including me, after the horrors of partition, somehow Indians have forgotten that the civilization belongs to two rivers of which both have been lost to them. The word India comes from the Indus, which in all its glory evades India, no matter where you look at it. The other river that you have is the Ganga, of which the Delta has been lost to you. And truncated rivers don't make civilizations. India, if it has to go back and claim its heritage of sunken cities in Dwarka, will have to admit that as it stands today, it is a mere shadow of itself with its both limbs cut off and a body that cannot grow them back. <coughs> today, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, you are without your limbs, and yet you walk around as if they never existed. Forgotten is the Sindhu, forgotten is Chittagong, forgotten is Dhaka, forgotten is Lahore. The city of Ram's son is no longer home to any of you because you have bought into the notion that civilization doesn't matter, all matters is borders. And borders don't really make civilization. Civilizations occurred when borders didn't exist. In 1947, a million people were killed in the name of hatred by just one man. But today, we blame the man who opposed that man. Muhammad Ali Jinnah is not criticized. Mahatma Gandhi is. Even the creator of TED owes his birth to that India that we have lost, he goes to Pakistan sometimes, which is not a name of a country, it's an acronym. And which, by the way, changed its name to Bangladesh in 1971. And what was left of Pakistan is called now the truncated state of Pakistan. And to the utter amazement of people like me, few Indians think of Pakistan as India. Yet, they are perfectly comfortable recognizing Mr. Naipaul, who comes from Trinidad as Indian. But I am treated as a Pakistani. I come from Lahore. I come from the city that was awe-inspiring in its majesty, not because it had a majority of Sikhs, Hindus, or Muslims, but because it had a majority of Punjabis who couldn't figure out who was in the majority because they were all Lahoris, and they used to say that if you haven't seen Lahore, you haven't seen the world. Today, you don't want to see Lahore, because it has changed into a city run by Saudi Arabia. And if the one million people that got sacrificed to satisfy the ego of Iqbal, who couldn't win the Nobel Peace Prize, thanks to Tagore, and thus changed his Tarana to Milli Tarana, you lost another three million people. In the delta of the Ganga, they were short, they were dark-skinned, they didn't speak Hindi or Urdu, so they were inferior. So what happened? A hundred thousand Punjabi Muslim Pakistani troops went there and committed genocide. What happened next? The Indian army went and liberated them and took their fellow Punjabi speaking Pakistani prisoners of war, showed them Pakiza, gave them sidearms, and gifted them back to Pakistan. 5,000 war criminals were freed by the Republic of India because no Indian general could speak Bangla and no Mukti Bahini fighter could speak Punjabi or Hindi or Urdu. 
Thus we created a monster again and again and again. We gifted Pakistan as a civilization with 5,000 war criminals who had raped, murdered, and slaughtered people for just one reason. They were dark-skinned, they were short, and they were considered of an inferior caste. Let no one ever forget that. If you want to talk of an Indian civilization, today the way Bangladeshis are referred to in India is a disgrace for Indian civilization. A Bangladeshi is more of an Indian than the Frenchman who lives in Chennai and writes about the Vedas. Yet we dare not ever make a mockery of a white man and we take deep pleasure in condemning the dark-skinned person. And this will not happen until and unless the torn off limbs of India are not necessarily rejoined but recognize that those are my limbs that the British cut off and left us without our arms and convinced us that we can still live. All we have to do is invade Goa and we will be great. My brothers and sisters, forgotten in this entire tragedy of the last 70 years is a war that is being fought right now. A war in Balochistan, a state invaded by the Republic, Islamic Republic of Pakistan in 1948, a country that became independent three days before India became independent, a country, a place that had Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Zoroastrians living for hundreds of years with never one communal incident in the last three to four hundred years. That is the place that India forgot. That is the place that the state of Kalat wanted to join the Union of India. But the Indian Prime Minister said, Wo bohat dur hai. Jao. On the other side, Badshah Khan had to tell Mr. Gandhi, you have left us to the wolves. And Mr. Gandhi shrugged his shoulders. Mr. Nehru was content. They had a republic. They had gotten rid of the Muslims. And who wanted to live? with another 200 million people who could cause disunity. So Indian civilization today cannot be captured, cannot even be conceived. This India incredible with a dot and an I is useless sloganeering by the advertising agencies that have ruined you. Because India today is the river Indus. And not today, not tomorrow, not in 10 years, or maybe 100 years or 1,000 years, that river will continue to flow. And mark my word, the wound, the amputation done by the British by the creation of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, which today is the mother load of international terror and is the sample of ISIS that threatens the entire world, exists because India thinks that it understands its neighbor. India doesn't even know its neighbor. Indians would not even be able to tell what is the language spoken just west of Rajputana or Rajasthan. Indians don't know that west of Fazilka, the same people live, or Tarantaran is next to Kem Karan, is next to Kasur, the birthplace of Bhulesha. You have forgotten, you have not just abandoned us to the wolves, you have started feeding the wolves by your Aman Kiyasha. You have today abandoned 50,000 Baloch young men who have been killed by the Pakistan army. 18,000 men have disappeared. Baloch men and women also are dropped from military helicopters in the sands and mountains of Balochistan. And I was shocked to find out at the center of 
South Asian studies at JNU that not a single student know or knew where was Balochistan or what was the state of Kalat. Where the Nanika Mandir, 900 year old temple is today guarded by a thousand Muslim Baloch who have told the Pakistanis that on this land not a single minority blood sh will be shed. Take your rotten Pakistan and take it back to Uttar Pradesh, Nawabs and the Muslims of Punjab. We do not want this. We are Indians. And they wrote on a mountain top in black paint. Perhaps I might not vote for Mr. Modi, but it was written, Ab ki bar Modi Sarkar. And in India, nobody could read it. They thought it was Allahu Akbar. Because everything written in Urdu, Arabic is Islamic, you see. No Indian knew what was happening. How many know that there are Baloch families living in Gujarat, in Maharashtra? How many know that the African community of uh, Surat is Baloch? No one. So my dear friends, brothers and sisters, I am saying that the independent state of Kalat that existed on March 27, 1948, that was invaded by the Pakistan army after it had been repulsed from the state of Jammu and Kashmir, which you remember all the time, but you forget the state of Kalat. I urge you to rise up, talk to your friends and families and every Indian who meets and says, not tomorrow, maybe tomorrow, but not even if in a hundred years, but we will never, ever, ever forget that an Indian is an Indian irrespective of whether he's in Trinidad or in Pakistan. Because an Indian is defined by the river Indus. And we are Indians whether we are Muslim, Hindus, Sikhs or atheists. Or we belong in, believe in flying horses or talking snakes. It does not matter because we never invaded any land, anywhere in the world. And those who invaded us and murdered us and committed atrocities on us, we will not celebrate them. And if there is one Indian who wants to put this in action, he can come with me and we'll take a pail of black paint and wherever the word Aurangzeb is written, we will put a slash across it and say, my Muslim leader of India is Dara Shiko, not the mass murderer Aurangzeb. But is there an Indian who will rise to do that? I'm afraid after 67 years, there is not a single Indian with the courage to say that the murderer of Tej Bahadur is not my worthy of the name in my capital street. That Dara Shiko, who translated the Upanishads into Farsi, into French, into English, is my leader. But you have no street named after the greatest Indian. You have a street named after a mass murderer. Who was the first member of the Taliban and the Islamic State that today we are fighting. And you celebrate it in the city of Delhi. My time's running out. I just have to say that it has been a pleasure to be in this great city of Patiala, to be in the Punjab where my forefathers lived, to be in a state where the Hindu, Muslim and Sikh, Christian, Zoroastrian lived as a single family, whether in Patiala or whether in Lahore, whether Rawalpindi or Ludhiana, whether it was Ambala or whether it was Kasur. Bulle Shah has been forgotten by the people of India and your children are not named Dara Shiko? Name them and Indian Muslims have to lead this fight. For goodness sake, stop naming your children after Arab invaders. Name them after people who fought the Arab invaders. Unless and until you do that, that schism will always be there. You cannot be divided into communities based on religion. You should be based, the communities of India should be based on ideas. Whether you're a socialist or you're a free market enterprise. Whether you believe in environmentalism. That is your community. 
or whether you believe in the complete abolition of the caste system, not from the laws, but from your minds. So when your daughter marries a black man, you don't go to pray to your God to say, oh God, let there be a divorce because I want my daughter to be happy. Because India is never going to be a great civilization unless and until India's daughters are free to choose who they love and irrespective of the skin color, caste, religion, or background. Because we are sons and daughters of a civilization that we inherited. We didn't create it. The ones who created are lying dead in the mounds of Mohenjo-daro. We are the great, 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 great grandchildren of great people. And unfortunately, we are behaving like midgets and pygmies because we do not know that we are in a gold mine looking for charcoal pieces. Get rid of your smallness and be big enough to take hold of India and make it your future and say to the world, never again will someone have to urinate in the mouth of a fellow Indian because as long as that can be done, as long as a woman can be raped, India is not a civilization. India will be a civilization when a woman can walk on the streets of Delhi irrespective of what she wears. And never would a rich man scold every man that is poorer than him simply because he can do it. Because as long as you insult a fellow Indian, you cannot claim to be an Indian of dignity. I am a foreigner in some ways to your land and I can tell you in two months living in India, I have seen every man who can shout at a poor man exercise his power and shout and scream. People are terrified of the rich people. As long as the rich and elite of this country consider working poor as worthless, dark-skinned, lower caste people, you are not doing justice to those who gifted you with this amazing land covered and sheltered by the great Himalayas and irrigated by the Indus and the Ganga and the Narbada and the Kerala Ghats and the Tamil Nadus, a Sri Lankan, a Bhutanese, a Sikkimese, a Maldivian, a Pakistani, they're all Indians. So never ever attribute Indianness to being just within the borders of what is India today. India is much, much larger. It is as large as the Mars orbit where your satellites go round and round. That is what is India. Thank you very much for giving me your time. <laughs>